In this episode, we talk about suicide. The brave and wonderful Kristen Bride shares the story of how her son Carson lost his life. If this is something that would be too upsetting for you, please skip to the next episode. This episode is dedicated to the life of Carson Bride. Cut short too soon. Welcome to Scrolling to Death. I'm Nikki, and today I'm joined by the incredible Kristen Bride. Kristen is a social media reform advocate who has accomplished so many incredible things in the past few years in support of protecting our children online. So Kristen, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me, Nikki. Of course. So here, uh, the listeners at Scrolling to Death are parents who are worried about social media. I look to educate other parents and myself on what is safe and what is not for our kids when it comes to technology. And one thing that I've learned that is not safe is anonymous apps. And that's going to be the focus of our discussion today. And so Kristen, you learned about anonymous apps in literally the worst way one possibly could. So would you be open to sharing uh, that story with us today? Sure. So on June 23rd, 2020, we lost our son, Carson, who is 16, to suicide. And it was sudden and completely unexpected. What we didn't know as parents is that he had been silently battling cyberbullying from his high school Snapchat friends who were using the anonymous apps YOLO and LMK to hide their identities. Just to give you some background, we were really conservative Mm -hmm. with um, phones and technology with our, our sons. Carson didn't have his first phone until he was in eighth grade, and it was a really old Um, version with no apps on it. And we had really hoped that it would stay that way. But unfortunately, when he got to high school, he was begging for Snapchat because that's the way all the kids were connected. Mm -hmm. So we did know he had Snapchat. But what we didn't know is that Snapchat had allowed two inexperienced startups on their back end Um, YOLO and LMK, which provided anonymous features to their billions of young users. And so when through the school community, I learned that Carson had been bullied on YOLO, my first reaction was, what is that? Mm -hmm. And so I did some research and YOLO had actually made promises to young users that they would monitor for cyberbullying and reveal the identities of those who do so and ban them from the app. And so I reached out over the only email that they had and let them know what happened to my son and and wanted them to follow their own policies. And I was ignored all four times. And so that's really when I had a decision to make. Do I just lay in bed and cry and accept this, that this is just the way our country is, or do I begin to fight back? And I chose the latter. And that is really the only way that I can live with this level of grief and loss. Thank you for sharing that story. I'm I'm so sorry for your loss. I've had a suicide within my family as well. And I know I was going to tear up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it can be difficult to talk about it. And, um, so I, I appreciate you having the strength to do that today. So you were, you were able to file a lawsuit, right? Against YOLO and LMK. Can you tell us about that? Sure. I filed a lawsuit, a national class action lawsuit against Snapchat, YOLO and LMK. And as soon as we filed the lawsuit in May 2021, Snapchat immediately suspended YOLO and LMK from their product. And then in March of the following year, they made a policy change that they would no longer allow anonymous features on their back end um, because the harms of cyberbullying could not be mitigated at an acceptable level. Now, of course, I wish that they had thought about this beforehand and my son might still be alive, Right. um, but it doesn't seem to work that way, unfortunately, with big tech. 
it was such a win to have those anonymous apps off of Snapchat. But what happened was immediately in their place, two other ones came onto the market, send it and not going to lie. And not going to lie has interfaced with Instagram. That is a problem because in addition to allowing anonymous features, they are charging kids for useless hints as to who is messaging them. And so just recently with Fair Play, I filed an FTC complaint against NGL. So we're waiting to hear back for the fraudulent practices and really taking advantage of teens and their insecurities. Just to give you some history of anonymous apps, they've been around for decades. And what typically happens is that they get released especially to young users, because there's no better way to keep kids online longer than to create drama. And when you have no accountability for what you're typing, Mm -hmm. Mm. it, it creates a lot of drama. And so what happens is they get released. There's complaints of cyberbullying, typically a suicide. They shut down and then a new one comes out. And so To me, this was preventable. This was something that big tech knows is harmful. And they're just in it for a quick buck um, until somebody gets harmed. And then kids like my son are collateral damage. And it's, it's really, really sad and discouraging. So that new anonymous app is still available on Instagram? Yes. Is there any way for parents to know if their child is using this anonymous app? You can check their phones and and really, you know, talk to them about, and and this is something that I talk to my kids about. I actually put a sign over their computers, both of them. And I said on it, don't type anything that you wouldn't want on a billboard with your name and face next to. And I think the more parents Mm -hmm. talk about that, Um, and realize that there's power in the words that they say to other people. And in the end, I'm really proud of Carson. He handled the the cyberbullying by not lowering himself, but asked the kids to swipe up and identify themselves so they could talk things out in person. He was trying to do the right things, but, you know, clearly these kids did not have parents they talk to their kids about this and the importance of how you behave online. And kids have, have been bullied forever and it can be part of almost anyone's story. But now that it's happening online where kids can hide behind the screen and also have further anonymity through anonymous apps, why do you feel bullying is so much more dangerous when it happens online? You can't escape it. When you were bullied at school, you could go home and get a break from it. Mm. But this happens 24-7. Another thing parents can do is make sure that their kids' phones are not in their bedrooms at night. Really limit the amount of time that they spend and the access that they they spend alone um, on their phone experiencing this tragedy and doing research, I found only a very small percentage of kids report that they're being cyberbullied to an adult, the school, or their their parent. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be considered a snitch. They certainly don't want to risk having their phone taken away. These products have been made to be extremely addictive for our children. Um, So that thought is scary. And if there's online drama happening to you, the last thing you want is to be out of it and, you know, hear about it later from somebody else. Kids also think that they can handle it themselves. And I'm sure that Carson felt that way at first, but it became so overwhelming to him. I mean, there were hundreds of negative, harassing, horrendous, sexually explicit messages to him. And you were never able to figure out who sent those messages? No. You know, thankfully, he took screenshots of them. Yes, these the two companies, YOLO and LMK, have either been unwilling or unable 
to provide us with that information. And our lawsuit with YOLO is continuing on appeal. And when it comes to kids not sharing these experiences with with their parents, can you tell us about passing Carson's Law and what, what that hopefully did to help inform families about cyberbullying and bullying? So one of the um, things when this happened, I, I needed to kind of organize my thoughts on, on advocacy. And mm-hmm. um, I worked with the school that was like very local level to bring in experts to talk about cyberbullying and the dangers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at the state level, I reached out to our local representatives and asked if there was anything I could do to help uh, at the state level. Representative Drazen had written a law that required that parents be informed by the school when there's any incidents of bullying, cyberbullying or bullying in person, both the victim, the parents of the victim and the aggressor. Okay. I testified multiple times. I've got, I got a Democrat to co-sponsor it with Representative Raisin, uh, Senator Wagner, and um, it passed. And she had been working on this for three years. And it really showed me that when you put a face to the harms um, of this and, Mm -hmm. you know, through the discovery of what the school did as far as investigations, we learned that one of the kids that we had actually filed a complaint against that was bullying Carson at school, that their parents were never informed. Oh, wow. And so I think that if you want to really address the problem, all parties need to be involved. And so it was nicknamed Carson's Law. And that's Oregon HB 2631, if anyone wants to look that up. Okay. And so parents everywhere are struggling with when or whether or not to let their kids even use social media and what apps are okay to use or what they want to decide around that. And I ask nearly everyone I interview, if you had a younger child right now, would you let them use social media? Oh, absolutely not. I would say wait as long as you can. Uh, You know, clearly we waited until basically Carson was in high school and that really wasn't even (laughs) long enough You know, we saw a a definite um, increase on the phone. I heard Carson mention, well, I don't have as many followers or likes. You know, kids very quickly start turning to these artificial measurements for popularity instead of focusing on actual friendships with people. And the longer you can wait the more that your child will develop interests outside of a screen and and really have an understanding of what a real friendship is beyond number of likes and followers. And that just makes a more confident and secure child and then adult. I really believe in that for my children are eight and under still, but uh, even with my adult friends, I purposely don't connect online. I don't feel it adds value. Uh, I recently spoke with Alex Fraser of Issue One, and we talked about these platforms being unsafe by design. He described that even if every single person on social media only spread love and goodness, the bad stuff would still get through, the addictions would still take hold. So do you agree that social platforms are unsafe by design and that's what needs to be addressed? Yes. I definitely do. You know, we recently, I don't know if you had a chance to read the report, the lawsuit against Meta, and then listen to the hearing of the the new whistleblower. Yes, I did. It's very overwhelming to read. I was actually reading the actual lawsuit and Mm. time and time again, the scientists and the employees at Meta for bringing up, this is harmful. The plastic surgery filter is harmful. The lights, is it's harmful. Mm-hmm. And Mark Zuckerberg just completely ignored it because all he cared about was average daily users and the amount of time our kids spent online. So the whole business model of social media is to keep kids addicted 
and on their phones so that they can collect the data and sell it to advertisers. And when you go back to that business model and you follow the money, they're not going to put our kids first. No. And I'm not going to trust anything that puts profit over people. Mm -hmm. In February of 2023, you, you testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee to demand federal legislation to better protect our children online. So can you tell our listeners about um, the bill you are supporting and what it entails? Uh, yes. So I'm supporting the Kids Online Safety Act, um, which the nickname is COSA. The most important part of the bill to me is that it requires these companies to have a duty of care to prevent and mitigate harms when they're designing their products. And it specifically goes into, it it names cyberbullying, eating disorder content, uh, suicide information, um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the sale of illegal drugs. I mean, it's actually, when you think about this, I mean, this is what is happening online. And a lot of this information is being fed to our children over algorithms. It's not something they're looking up. You know, I have advocated with families that their child has had eating disorders. It started by looking up a fitness routine for a sport. And then this child has just gotten flooded with pro anorexic content. And this is what's really harmful and it, it's got to stop. The other part about COSA that I appreciate, you've all listened to my story, is that I didn't get a response from these companies. You know, the, the absolute worst thing happened and they would not even reply, except I did get a canned response that said, thank you. We're looking into your email. Have a great day. Um, so that was a real soccer punch to the gut. Um, so COSA would require the large companies to respond within a certain time period. And outside of my situation, I've been contacted by other parents whose child is on suicide watch because they're being cyber bullied or something false is being spread about them. And when they reach out to Instagram and Snapchat, they're completely ignored. And I, I really feel like this accountability of having to respond to families in crisis is essential. It's just shocking that they don't, that you didn't get a response, that these people don't get responses. No. It's basic, basic stuff. Even worse, they get responses that say it meets community guidelines. We have advocates in our group that um, children, their children have died by the choking challenge and they report it and they get, they're either ignored or they're told that it meets community guidelines because the child did not die on the video. What? I mean, this is, I mean, it, it's so hard to talk about because it's almost unbelievable. And I, I honestly do not understand how these executives go home and sleep at night. I called Mark Zuckerberg out in a recent video and just like, what if this was your kid? Mm -hmm. Once you know, you can never unknow. And I just want as many parents to know what's on there and just make an informed decision. Right. We have the responsibility as parents with the information that is available to us now to know. Right. And prepare our kids. So I think the more that we can create communities of like-minded parents – Yes. And I've talked to parents whose children are not on phones and Mm -hmm. they have really good friends that aren't on phones as well. And they're doing Mm -hmm. creative things. They're, you know, I see them out in the park and they're doing plays and they're writing plays and they're doing cartwheel. Like, and it becomes shocking to them when they go to school and they see their peer group all staring into a phone. It's almost like if you can raise the kids outside of this bubble, they can see it for what it is. And it can be hard to find people in your community that are like-minded because it doesn't come from a judgmental place, but 
to bring up these discussions with other parents. You don't want them to feel judged by you. Right. The more we can find ways to connect, because I mean, everyone's struggling, even if they're using screens, they're seeing behavioral issues, they're, they're struggling with it and questioning how much time should I allow them. And, you know, this is applicable from young ages as well and across every family. Right. Are you familiar with the kids' safe phone companies like Bark and Pinwheel and Trumi? And um, for listeners, they have phones that are more stripped down, so absolutely no social media. Only one of the companies offers some limited controlled internet browsing. It looks like you are familiar with them. So how do you feel about these phones as like a first step in their journey to using a full smartphone as an adult? Well, I've never personally promoted a, pro- a specific product. Right. No, me either. I don't have any affiliation, but I really like the idea. You know, I had heard at one point that they were trying to bring back flip phones, make them colorful so that they were appealing. But I was just talking to a parent recently whose child um, takes a bus in a big city to go to school and he's 11 and she gave him an iPhone. And I said, well, what about a flip phone? And she said she didn't want him to feel left out because of all, you know, his peers having the iPhone. But if if you really want to just connect with your kid to know to pick them up, mm-hmm. start with a, a just a basic phone with none of the apps, because that's really what you want it for and, and hold strong. I agree. And they they do make most of these companies and Verizon has the Gizmo Watch. There are watch options that still Mm -hmm. have a video chat option and you can add contacts, but it's obviously so much more limited in watch form. I think it's important for parents to know that there are other options, whether it be a flip phone, a kid's safe phone. The Light Phone is another company that makes a really stripped down phone. The being left out excuse is a big one. I hear it all the time and I I get that. No one wants their kid to feel left out. But you have to weigh what's more important, being left out or being exposed to really inappropriate and dangerous content. Right, right. It's super important when you introduce a phone to be having these open conversations and you know, you, even when you gave internet use to your boys, you had this sticker on the top of your, their computer saying, be aware that what you put out there is, can be viewed by anyone at any time mm-hmm. forever. What should parents be communicating with their children when it's time to introduce a device, making sure they, they understand the dangers? A lot of people do the contracts with their child about, in really making it clear, especially the parents are paying for this phone, right? It is, and I said this to um, to my boys, like, it is our phone. We're letting you use one, but we can take it away at, at any point. And with that, you know, we knew Carson's password. Like, we knew, we know mm-hmm. our other son's password, you know, like, so it was not this private thing, you know, at any given point you know, we might have to look at it. So kind of starting out with that, I think, especially giving it as a gift, you know, for Christmas, then it's my phone, you know, you gave it to me as a gift, but this is something that we're, that a shared responsibility that we all have, um, keeping, you know, everybody keeps their phones, you know, charging in the kitchen at night and putting limits on, you know, how long you're on the phone. And and like you said, modeling behavior for your children. What we did was, you know, at the dinner table, we would, I would talk about some of the things that I had heard that had gone wrong online, Mm -hmm. especially, you know, Carson didn't have a phone at the time, but kids in his class, it was sixth grade, believe it or not, had phones and they were sending around nudes of each other. And so I had a long talk with my boys about how that's considered pornography and child pornography and it's illegal and you can go to jail for that. And, you know, so it wasn't like I was lecturing them like they had done it. Like this is a very big mistake with consequences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, really proud of my son in the end, they were asking Carson for nudes. And he said, I don't do that. 
you know, and, and that's another really important conversation to have with your children when they get to be of a certain age. I advocate with a lot of parents who, and this is grow, a growing trend, have died by suicide because of sextortion. And so always have your, and always have your kid have a private account not one that's open mm-hmm. to the public, of course. But these people get in usually from another country and they pretend to be interested in, and the target is usually young males in high school. And they pretend to be a girlfriend. They get them to give a compromising photo or video. And immediately the extortion starts coming and they, they are asking for thousands of dollars um, or the pictures will be sent to their parents and to their mother. And this takes a very happy, confident, popular kid two hours to end their life. It can go that fast, right? And it goes that fast. And so if you tell your kids to never ever do that under any circumstances, that's not going to be an issue. And if you make sure that they have a private account, but even, you know, I can't even guarantee that with private accounts, who knows who can get in. Right. There's a, a workaround, it seems like, for everything. And a couple things I've learned about sextortion. A therapist I spoke with that has done a few uh, research articles on this topic uh, told me that there's call centers set up in other countries specifically for this. I mean, they know exactly what to say, exactly how to manipulate these young kids, boys and girls, mostly boys, and that a lot of parents will comment, well, uh, they're never going to send the nudes. Like, just don't pay. Mm -hmm. But Again, more parents have reached out to me saying they do. They do send the nudes. Right. And it can be very detrimental to the child's life and social life. Right. And it's out there. Once it's out there, I mean, that's the other thing to Mm -hmm. really talk to your kids about. Once it's out there, it doesn't go away. Right. So kids need to know about this. I mean, even at my kids' young ages, they'll take my phone and want to take pictures and there's been a time or two where they've tried to take a picture of their sibling's butt or something. And I have to have that conversation now. Yeah. This early about the privacy, about privacy. And we do not share, we do not take photos of our bodies and especially not for sharing. So that can start early and be relevant (laughs) earlier than you think. Right. And another thing to mention too is with generative AI, there's cases of children's teens photos being taken and using AI, the clothes being removed. And so fake nude Mm -hmm. photos being shared and legislation has not caught up to be able to protect kids in the right way from this type of thing happening. So just scary, scary stuff when you're sharing your image and your likeness and your information on social media. I did ask the new meta whistleblower, Arturo Behar, I asked him if we should be letting our teenagers on social media or on Instagram specifically. And he said not until 15 at a minimum due to the inappropriate and dangerous things, content and people they get exposed to. But expert after expert, person after person I speak to is restricting social media for as long as possible Mm -hmm. for their children. Right. And every family gets to make that decision on their own, Mm -hmm. but know the risks and have the conversations uh, and make a critical decision around that. Yeah, and I think it's like the constant conversations. You know, it's, Carson would tell me when things did not go well at school, but he did not tell me about this, you know, and that's what's heartbreaking. What do you think the difference is between being in person and then being How would he be open to share the in-person conflicts, but not the online conflicts? I think it gets back to the the reasons why kids don't don't tell when they're being cyber bullied. Um, It's the phone thing. You know, there's a lot of struggle around the phone. And, you know, not that I would have said this to him, but, you know, I've heard in some articles they say, you know, the kids don't want to hear, I told you so, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know a family that doesn't struggle 
with this. Like put your phone away, you know, <laughs> take a break from the screens. It's this constant battle. It's, I mean, and that's what parents need to know. Once you introduce this, you cannot go back. And I heard one um, expert say that she speaks to a lot of parents and there is not a parent out there that says, I wish I had given my child a phone earlier. Mm-hmm. Instead, it is the very opposite of that. Mm-hmm. And I hear a lot of kids sharing once they hit 18, 20, when their parents have restricted use of social media or restricted phone use, they actually end up thanking a lot of kids, thank their parents yes. for not letting them, especially on social media, because they see how their friends are getting negatively affected and they're so grateful that they don't have to deal with that. Right. And that's that's being like what I talked about outside of the that bubble, right? If you're in it with a bunch of friends that are all staring at their phones, you're thinking that's normal. But if you're doing other things, you can see that it's not. We just need to get more kids and parents outside the bubble. <laughs> and yes. You know, I, I read a stat that 80% of teenagers shared that they've never talked to their parents about social media before, not one time. And so still parents are letting their kids have social media in the majority and not talking to them about it. The communication at a baseline is vital to protecting your kids. Yeah. It's the constant conversation. It's not just the contract in the beginning and then you put it away, you know, and there's ways to have those conversations that are positive. Like what's the funniest thing you saw on your phone today Mm -hmm. to kind of get them talking. And what I noticed was, especially boys, you don't sit down and stare and have the conversation. You do something together. You're driving in the car, Mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're putting something together and that's when you bring up the conversation. Yeah, that I mean, that's the easiest way to even talk to my husband. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if I sit him down and try to talk to him, he's like, oh, no, what did I do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anything else that parents should be aware of regarding anonymous apps? I would just, you know, again, reiterate to your kid, if you're typing something and you don't feel like your name should be next to it, think about it. Do you really need to do that? And, you know, it's my hope that we can raise awareness through legislation, through this FTC complaint that we filed against NGL and, you know, the closure of those two apps on Snapchat, um, that, that anonymous apps are dangerous for kids mm-hmm. and it, um, they need to stay away from them. I don't understand any benefit to being anonymous online. Yeah. I I would love to see their marketing uh, message. Yeah. They, they, you know, YOLO had promoted it as kids will say really nice things about each other. Oh, sure. That they would, that they wouldn't say. And it's better to say it anonymously than wouldn't you want people to know who's saying that? That that? theory really doesn't work. If you're going to say something nice, you would say it to the person and be acknowledged for it. Right. Mm, That's a big reach. You know, you got to go back and follow the money and it's wherever there's going to be the most drama that will suck kids in is what they're looking to do. Mm -hmm. And they really don't care about the mental health or well-being of our kids. And, you know, that is something also I think really you can talk to your teen about. Do you want to be these companies' product? Because you are the product. Mm -hmm. And, you know, teens sometimes don't like the thought of, like, somebody overpowering them or controlling them. And, you know, I think they need to understand the business model. And do they really want to contribute to this? And hand over not only the images and the videos, but every little piece of data, every friend that they have all in a file Mm -hmm. within that company's database so that they can continue to target you with ads and manipulative uh, feeds forever. Right. I won't get into sharing our kids' information online and doing the same thing. Right, right, right. right. That's for another episode. Yes. Tell me about your work in cyberbullying, so Fair Play Network. Uh, yes. So when I, going back to the beginning of the story, when um, YOLO ignored me four times, I, at that point, 
I did not know where to turn. And I had watched The Social Dilemma. Mm -hmm. That influenced me a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And so I reached out to the Center for Humane Technology and I said, look, this just happened to my son. I reached out to YOLO on four occasions and I'm being ignored. Can you help me? I don't know what to do. Yeah. And the other part of this is I really wanted to connect with other parents who had lost a child to social media harms. I knew I wasn't alone and I desperately needed to find a community. And so that was the other thing I asked Center for Humane Technology and they weren't equipped for that sort of work, um, but they connected me with Jean Rogers from Fair Play's Action Network. And at the time they had work groups, but none with parent survivors. And so in the spring of 2021, um, I co-founded with another parent, Joanne Bogart, who had lost her son to the choking challenge. She had done the same thing. She had reached out to the Center for Humane Technology. And so we were both Mm -hmm. directed to Jean. We started the online harms prevention work group with just two members in it. And we have grown to 63 members today with 23 of those parents having actually lost a child to social media harms. Wow. And so our mission as a group is to educate on uh, parents on online harms and to advocate for legislation to hold big tech accountable for their harmful and addictive products, as well as the dangerous information that is being fed to our children. Yes, within the algorithms and within advertisements. Mm -hmm. Where can parents find out more about that group and kind of follow along? So it's fairplayforkids.org. Okay. And then um, there's an action network tab that you can find um, when you go to the website. And then for parents who probably the easiest place to advocate for COSA, the Kids Online Safety Act, we just learned that we won't probably get a Senate floor vote this year, but first in January, that's the target date. We have gone to DC with this parent survivor group from the Online Harms Prevention Network, three different times talking to senators, we've gotten 49 Senate co-sponsors and we have other senators that haven't co-sponsored, but they are going to vote positively on it. So we are really hopeful that we'll get it to the Senate floor and then a companion bill in the House as well. It's There's no other social media bill that has gotten this far and has this much bipartisan support. And so parents can go to passcosa.org and if they type in their state, it will direct the email appropriately to your senator. It will thank them for co-sponsoring if they've co-sponsored. It will ask those that haven't to co-sponsor. So we could really use the help of parents to continue the flow of support for COSA so that we can get it scheduled in January for a Senate floor vote. Amazing. And I, and I reached out to my state senators on this. Um, I did not use the Pass Costa website, and I even found it to be super simple and easy. It took me a few minutes. So parents can educate themselves at passcosa.org and then take that next step if they choose to support, right? Yes. Yes. Amazing. So Kristen, thank you so much for sharing your story yet again. It means so much to me and all the parents that you are willing to do this so we can learn what tragic events can happen to our kids online and that we all need to be so careful and critical thinkers around these topics. To the listeners, I hope that you can turn off this episode, take a moment to remember Carson Bride and all the kids that we've lost due to these issues and who should all be with us today. So again, Kristen, um, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you for having me. And I I listened to, you did an episode on um, like all the kids who had died. And I think you talked about Carson. Yes. And I thought it was so nicely done. Thank you. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. I think you said rest in peace or something. It just, I knew that the feeling I get is he doesn't want to be forgotten. So 
I'm trying to do that in my work, but I really appreciate um, the way you handled that with such integrity and and ta- in talking about Carson. Thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. It can be so touchy, and I I hesitated in sharing actual stories and actual names, but when the when the parents have chosen to do that for the purpose of yes um, awareness, I I feel the need to amplify that. So. Yeah. I'm so glad that resonated and I did a good job. (laughs) You did. Thank you, Kristen. (laughs) 